بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ویلکم آڈینس ٹو دا لیٹسٹ ایپیسوڈ آف دا ٹوک ان دین پوڈ کاسٹ ناؤ ول آئی ایم یور ہاؤس ماجد اور ٹیک دا ماسک آف یور ریکگنائز از ڈیفلی می بٹ ٹوڈے از سیشن از از ڈفرنٹ ٹو دا نوم ون سو بفور آئی مینشن اینڈ انٹروڈیوس مائی گیسٹس یو نو آج ون sort of uh, lay, lay the stage that, you know, obviously we know the time at the moment, there's uh, a lot of self-quarantining going on at the moment. And uh, the Talking Theme podcast is in the same situation. But we thought, you know, that uh, the Talking Theme podcast may be in quarantine, but we're going to still continue talking, inshallah ta'ala, because there are pressing matters that need to be spoken about. Um, you know, even though uh, zombies are roaming the streets right now, Um, we still got to continue So inshallah ta'ala um, Also just to add as well that Today's podcast originally Was supposed to be uh, with uh, With Sim from the Mad Mamluks um, But yesterday Chicago has gone into Lockdown so the brother Was, was uh, not able to make it but uh, Our prayers and duas Are certainly with him um, So yes yeah, so inshallah ta'ala You know Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll kickstart and uh, I'll introduce my, uh, my hosts. Um, obviously, there's uh, the, my first host, I'm gonna, well, my co-host, shall I say, for this podcast is uh, Brother JK. And you will know Brother, well, Islam, Brother JK. And you will know Brother JK from the Talking Sira episodes. Um, he's our main Talking Sira guy. Then we have Brother Adris. Assalamu alaikum. Wa'alaikum <laughs> salam And Brother Adris is um, the, He looks after the Voice of the Ummah Twitter page So if you want to ever you know, Give a shout out, there's the man And also we have Brother Khairul um, Assalamu alaikum Wa'alaikum salam Brother Khairul And Brother Khairul is the one, the mastermind Who is behind <laughs> uh, All our production like posters And, and videos uh, So inshallah what we want to also do as well Is put a face to some of the names as well. Um, so, you know, we thought this is probably going to be the best way of doing this podcast, uh, even though it's a bit, bit short notice. So what I'm going to do is to, because we've got some new people on the podcast, um, JK suggested that we start off with a bit of an icebreaker um, and ask a question to all of you guys just to get things rolling. So I'm going to start off with Brother Adris. Yes, he's... Uh, Uh, the one who's going to kickstart off, inshallah. So, brother, the question I'm going to ask all of you, but I'm going to start off with you, is uh, if you were to be quarantined with anyone, okay, uh, within the last 1400 years, i.e. Muslim personality, uh, except you can't choose the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can't choose the sahaba, and also because I want your true opinion, you can't choose your wife as well, uh, and that goes for any of you guys. I know you guys might want to do that, you know, might be a bit pressure, but let's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not include wives and, and all these, right? So who do you think, Brother Idris, would who would you like to spend your quarantine time with? Bro, you put me at the spot, man. <laughs> Bro, this is the <laughs> podcast. You got to be ready for these things. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't even thought about that. <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult one, bro. It is a really difficult question. Okay, just you know, quickly, just, just think about the first name that comes into your head. First name, I'd say uh, Salahuddin Ayyubi. Subhanallah, oh, okay. okay. Mashallah. My one. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, why? Why? Uh, very quickly, why? Why, Adris? Um, I, I, I've studied a lot of uh, what he achieved, including his teachers. Um, I even named my son Salahuddin because uh, of how fond I am of what, what he's achieved. So Mashallah. I think... Yeah, he is a role model for me and for my kids. So they do read the story. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go with him. Okay, just because I'm going to give uh, Brother Khairul a little bit more time, I'm going to take this over to uh, Brother JK. So, Brother JK, who, who do you think? Yeah. Who would you spend, I mean, like to spend? Yeah. It is a difficult one, but yeah, I thought about it a little bit. And I'd probably say uh, Abdul Hamid the second actually. Because reason being, he was in a time where <laughs> You know, he saw uh, the, the golden, he didn't see it, but he knew, knew about the golden ages of the Ottoman Empire, but he also saw it coming to its end. So how he managed to keep it under wraps for so long. 
And even though he saw, you know, the Zionists asking for the land of Palestine and all of this. So it'd be interesting to get that take of, you know, and also we could probably take lessons from what he did then to how we would apply if Islam came to the realm of life today, how would you apply it today, inshallah? So probably Abdul Hamid, but it's a difficult question because there's so many names that come to mind. SubhanAllah. And uh, finally, with Khairul. Yeah, uh, difficult one, but firstly, I'm glad you've taken off your uh, mask because uh, I don't know if you've got the <laughs> wrong end of the stick or if I don't know something you know, but I, I'm pretty sure coronavirus can't be transmitted through Skype or, you know. Oh, you <laughs> should, you should have mentioned that, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, for, for a second, I was a bit worried there thinking, oh, should I have my mask on because I don't want to be <laughs> passing on anything. Um, no, good question. Um, I was thinking um, Imam Bukhari. Subhanallah. Because, um, there's, I heard you hear a few uh, stories about the brilliance of Imam Bukhari and his um, memory, how brilliant his memory was. And um, yeah, that, uh, that fascinated me. And that, that'd be amazing to sit with someone like that um, who can uh, reel off hadith after hadith chain uh, you know understanding and knowing the chain of the hadith as well um yeah there's some brilliant stories it's probably too long to go into the actual stories but i've heard a few and that's um that's fascinated me to be honest with you so imam bukhari if you're someone from the past definitely no that's really really good choices really good choices yeah, but what about you bro you, you yeah. never mentioned who you'd be with uh, much you're not gonna get out, uh, get out of this <laughs> yeah you know what to be honest with you, there's there's so many names, man. Uh, but what I would say is, uh, I know Adris has uh, uh, already sort of taken it, but I would say uh, uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, rahimahullah, uh, to be honest with you, purely because obviously we, we, are, we are fascinated because we're living in a time when, you know, Al Quds and Palestine is under occupation. And, uh, you know, obviously the biography of uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi is available for everyone. And also, we know that we have the seerah of the of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we look to these for our solutions uh, to the seerah and to the the revelation. But you know, I would like to speak to him about you know how he was able to overcome and the obstacles and unite the ummah, and also maybe even ask him what what he thinks about you know people cycling for Palestine and people doing these charity runs and and and, and going to the UN and stuff like that and and, and get his opinion on on these type of activities. You know, he would probably be angry at that stage, but but yeah, that's that's who I would say. But uh, but inshallah, okay, let, let's continue. Let's start. Let's continue with the podcast. So, as people have, may have gathered, the podcast is going to be about the coronavirus. I mean, at this moment in time, uh, how could anyone be speaking about anything other than coronavirus? Because everyone is speaking about this, right? So, um, you know, we know things are escalating. Uh, obviously, China now has. Uh, I said that they they fully like it, they've got the the virus fully under control, um, but we know in the UK certainly things are kicking off where um, you know the warnings are there. Maybe uh, the action by the government isn't following. But what do you guys think in regards to what's happening and and how long do you think this coronavirus is going to last? Anyone? I think it's quite difficult to say how long it's going to go on for. Um, because the effort to try and stop it or at least reduce its impact is a collective effort. And there's um, a lot of mixed messages out there about how much effort you should put in to preventing it, preventing its spread. So, you know, if, if half of society, uh, let's say that half of society in, uh, self-isolated, the other 50% are still spreaders. So... Mm -hmm. Is you know at the end of the day the the recommended suggestions um, through various sources, not just uh, UK government, but there's Sharia rules related to this situation as well. Um, if you put them all together and you follow the necessary advice, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about implementation. You put it together and it'll be over sooner. Uh, the longer you don't implement it, it'll be around for longer. That's my yeah. opinion. I have to, I'd agree with that. I think um, it's about the response. So, for example, China, like you said, China has got it under control, but um, as a result of the measures they put in place, um, so they, you know, some people might call it draconian or extreme, but they've literally enforced people not to um, interact and, and not to have social interactions being 
brought to a standstill. And I was watching a video earlier and they were speaking about how the way the people have reacted is that they've seen it as a civic duty, that they have to do it. Whereas, you know, if you think about the, you know, European lifestyle or the UK lifestyle, it's a lifestyle of freedom. It's a lifestyle of like having my liberties to go to the pub or go to the clubs. And when this is, uh, you know, clamped down on, will the people really follow? And, and, and we found that in London, for example, many people aren't following the rules and they're not following the advice. So because they live in a, you know, these, are, these societies don't really like rules. You know, freedom is sold to them as do what you want, do as you, as you wish. So now that these freedoms are being um, taken away from them, uh, it will be interesting to see whether the, you know, they can actually contain the virus in the same way China has. Yeah, and these people, they, they seem to, like you said, they don't like to follow the rules. So you saw, I saw a few articles of um, um, people on Friday night when they heard about the pubs and the clubs and everything are going to be closed. They went out and they were saying, look, this is going to be my final night. But they're completely going against what was being advised by uh, the government they're completely selfish thinking about themselves not thinking about the greater public health or pub greater public good um and this um there were some sad stories as well you know some of these um the emergency workers and uh, nhs staff going into um uh the supermarket late at night because they've been all day working uh you know trying to save people's lives basically and going into supermarkets finding that shelves and uh, empty um, because people have just gone in and even today I think there was an, an, uh, a, an allocated slot for NHS stuff to go into um, supermarkets and buy their their um, do their shopping um, and uh, I think it was a, a Tesco in West Midlands in Dudley um, where thousands of uh, just normal Joe public queuing up um, were basically hijacking that that hour where NHS, NHS staff are going to go in and do their shopping and most of the NHS staff who understand the virus ended up turning away and going back home because they knew look, thousands of people here gathering in one place there was actually a crush as well at the door um, they went back without any shopping um, so, so you know like um, yeah yeah I was just going to say because I was speaking to somebody who works in the NHS yeah and when I was speaking about lockdown and the, and, and the person said look you know I don't like the word lockdown because Nobody thinks that the NHS doesn't lock down. The mm. NHS, they don't stop the people. The so much pressure is on the on, on the people in the NHS. It's unbelievable right now. And the, the point you made there was fantastic, bro. The fact that if that hour was allocated for them, yet you know people ignored that. And at the same time, they obviously, like you said, they know that all these people they're so close to each other. Any one of them could be carriers. You know exactly. what I mean? And automatically you're passing it on and they can't get it because they have to be in the hospital. Is you know, they have to make sure. So, you know, what do you think what what reflection of on society has the coronavirus shown us? You know, what what the how is this in what light is is the society at large shown whilst yeah. this coronavirus issue has begun? It's really yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because um you like, like you said, you can see how it exposes certain elements of society. You know, when it comes to when they talk and when we're having conversation with you know, non-Muslim colleagues and stuff, you will generally get the, the right thing. They'll say the right thing, like, you know, caring about other people and stuff like that. But when it comes to a situation of emergency, that's when, you know, the, the truth is shown, right? And the true face is shown. So, you know, what is it highlight? Well, for me, it's like the good, the bad and the ugly. I have to, have to say that there has been some good. You know, some, there's some people that are thinking about humanity and thinking about both, both Muslim, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. They are few and far between, but there are a few people that are thinking about the NHS, they're thinking about the elderly and the vulnerable. And you've heard some good stories of where certain people have taken their own time to help out other people. Mm. Um, I was listening to a story where um, there was some old people waiting in their car for like 45 minutes near a shopping store and they were waiting for the right person to come past that they could ask to do their shopping for them, give, give them a list and give £100. And they found someone and this person did it and put it in a boot and just well, shared the story to say, look, you need to look out for the elderly because they're the most at risk. Um, well, that's the good, but then you see the bad. And the bad is where, you know, you see these people fighting over t uh, tissue Flying over a blue roll, um, just be, even though they've got a trolley full of blue, blue roll, subhanAllah, they still can't give it to someone else. Um, and 
you know, subhanAllah, I was listening to someone who's in Syria at the moment and he said, it's amazing when you do the comparison with those people living in Syria, when he went to give them aid, they would, even though they needed the aid, they needed the food, they would say to this person, oh, have you checked on that neighbor? Because that neighbor is more needy than me, subhanAllah. Now, how, how many people would have that viewpoint here? Because of that selfishness and greediness, they don't really have that viewpoint. And just to fin finalize, the, the ugly is really where you've seen some organizations, some companies, uh, try to profit from the situation where they've uh, hiked up prices. Uh, they've, you know, some people are selling uh, Lural for £10, uh, sanitizer for just inflating their price so high uh, just to benefit, not, not because, you know, they're struggling, just to benefit from a really dire situation. So, subhanAllah, it does tell you a lot about the society we live in. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, we even seen, I mean, and the reality is, is we can't exclude local Muslims from this as well because. You know, in, in the local community, there's been a case where, you know, people have, uh, you know, doubled the price, you know, quadrupled the price on, on, on some things. You know, I saw a, a picture of like Dettol was, uh, you know, like Dettol, just, just a little bottle was, I think it was around 15, 16 pound. So, you know, at the end of the day, the reality is, is that as Muslims, you know, when it comes down to times like this, you know, we should think about others before ourselves. But here, and I mean, a lot. Of, there have been a lot of videos going around. People saying that, look, um, you know, uh, we are increasing the prices because that's the fault of the people, because the people are hoarding. Okay, so that might be a different issue. Now, the only odd thing about that is, is that if you go to the supermarkets like your Aldi's or these, they haven't increased the prices, right? <laughs> so, so I mean, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know whether it is a case that the the consumer is at fault because at the same time, then you have got Muslims who are uh, okay, maybe they're thinking about think for themselves. Maybe people don't think about if I buy all of this, no one else will be able to get it. You know, there is a lot of scaremongering going on. But you know, what it does show is uh, it really does does show. Certainly in the West, it shows a society full of individuals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I was going to mention um, something similar. I saw some. Um, I think our brothers at Five Pillars actually um, posted it on uh, Insta Instagram. A uh, bag of cardamoms, thirty six ninety nine. Now, wow, yeah, you know that that's it's not like the uh, cardamoms have gone up in price to that level. Where a bag of card cardamoms, even from a demand and supply perspective, that's just ridiculous. That's somebody just trying to puff profit off it, uh, and that's and that's haram. But the bottom line is the fact that this society is. All, up, all about the individual. It's all about um, how to maximize your own indiv individual um, pleasure and how to benefit yourself. Um, that's what breeds selfishness. Um, individualism is all about myself as long as me and my family are okay. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's rubbed off on, on Muslims that live in this society. It's all, it's all uh, bred from the ideology of... Um, freedoms capitalism that that um you know uh, promotes individualism and and that's the issue really that's why you know sometimes you know whenever we think about saudi or or you know people are going to saudi or people are going to places like egypt or pakistan bangladesh right and the reality is is that with most of us who have been born in this country we're used to order we're used to queuing you know these things so what happens is you know when we visit those lands we, without even realizing it, we start looking down on those people like somehow we're better. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you something now. You know, the society should be judged. People should be judged not in a time of peace, in the time of adversity, right? Yeah. So what we yeah. see now is the fact that, you know, you know, when people live according to a system, then everything's going to be in order. It's in their interest, okay? Now, once that system's gone, like the Joker said, mm -hmm. the real beast, the real monsters will appear. And that's what happens, you know, and you see these people fighting over, you know, toilet roll or, or just generally over, over, you know, stuff in the supermarkets. And, and what you see is uh, this chaos. But the reality is, is that in the Muslim lands, we're not living under the Sharia. We don't have the Khilafah system, right, which regulates our man's affairs, right? We don't have this. We have dictators. We have really weird type of systems where in some places they're trying to implement democracy, but the people not really feeling it, that type of thing, right? But in reality, like JK gave the example of Syria, you don't see this there. 
in the sun. You don't see this there, whilst those people don't have, don't have a system. You know, yet we look down on those people. Subhanallah, imagine when there's a true Islamic system there. Those people will be an example for the world. But you look at here, you know, when people live life like, yeah, there's peace and security. Everyone's a, everyone's a guardian angel. Now, as soon as there's some news of, you know, money running out or bread running out and, you know, then it's all me, me, me. And then what you see, you see, you know, a reality of people who they, it's like, uh, it's like a different face. You see a different face. Why? Because there's, you know, people that personally, they only think about themselves. You understand? And I think that's a really good example of what this, what this shows is really that, you know, if this law and order wasn't here, then, you know, people really would be living, it'd be like the Wild West. You understand? People would be living, you know, the strong will make militias and have their rule and they, you know, it would be really survival of the fittest. And I think something like this brings out the nature and actually what it shows is it shows a decline in human qualities. And we see this. I was going to say, not only that, but it also exposes the system itself. Yeah, of because course. The, yeah. the system is what uh, teaches people how to manage their affairs um, as a community and, and as an individual. And if they can't balance that relationship, then that's the system's fault for not bringing that up in people. So mm. what, one part is the uh, system being misapplied or not being applied. But the other thing is, what does the system encourage people to do? And greed is at the, the forefront and the basis of, uh, of a Western society because it is about freedom, individualism. It's all about getting the best that you possibly can for yourself. And if you're lucky, that includes your family as well. But for most people, it's just yourself. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, as an example... Yeah, I can only give you my example, you know, with my mom, she's not too well. Uh, with my father, he just came from hospital yesterday, he was, you know. Um, and if I'm going to sort of like isolate myself a little bit, even though there's a bit of me telling me, and even this is not the right approach though, that look, I'm, I'm young, you know, someone may argue that, but generally I think I'm young, I'm healthy, alhamdulillah. So I'm not going to get it. But I'm at the same time, in my mind, I'm thinking, look, I don't want to get it. And then pass it on to somebody else, whether it's my parents, whether it's other people. You understand? So there's yeah. that element of you yeah. thinking about other people. But like uh, Khairul was talking about, you know, when people realize there could be a possible lockdown and address, I speak to Brother Adris earlier, and he was mentioning the same yeah. thing that as soon as people found out there may be a lockdown, right? What did they do, man? They went out clubbing, pubbing, you know, <laughs> because they don't care about anyone else. They, there could be someone who has that virus, but to him, all he wants to do is maximize maximize this life you know maximize the sensual gratification live life to the max he doesn't care about passing it on you know and the yeah. thing is is that yeah. just think about it just from last night just from last night how many cases new cases do you think there might be exactly only gonna, the thing is is that you're only going to know until two weeks time from now when they appear because the the and and you know i had um, a really good conversation with the doctor as well about this and you have to understand what's, what's actually being uh, highlighted in the media as confirmed cases. Now, uh, if Madge or any one of us guys gets uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus, that doesn't mean that now that's another number one on what the COVID-19 count is in the UK. Now, the next stage from one of us catching it is how severe does it get? Because there are instances of people who get a mild cold some get a really bad cold, some will get a temperature with it, some will get a severe cough, and all of these stages in between, you're still not included in that count, but you are able to pass it on to people who are in the high-risk category, okay? Yeah. The yeah. point that you get counted on that counter that everybody looks at on the news is when you're in a critical situation and you get taken into hospital and you're put on, on a ventilator, that's when you're counted as one person. So what you have to understand is whatever there's being reported on the news, as in coronavirus count in the UK, uh, it's difficult to say exactly how much more, but I reckon five to ten times more is what actually exists in the UK. And yeah, now you, you've got to consider now there's one person that could be infected who isn't uh, a high-risk person. Now, don't get me wrong. 
there's there's cases of of people who have died who are as low as 20 as young as 20 so you know you're you're ajalis from allah anyway that's a separate issue but could you would you feel comfortable living with the idea that you're not a high risk person but you've passed it on to your son or your daughter or your mom or your dad or a close relative who is a high risk person and as a result they're now in icu worst case scenario if um if the hospital beds are full they can't even get treatment and you might not know whether it was you or not but what if it was and if that's not yeah. enough to frighten people then surely uh, you know at the end of the day islam rules for everything and there is a rule for this and it's about implementation i think that it takes me back to salahuddin for a moment as well which is why i look up to him is he wasn't he wasn't uh, he wasn't a scholar he wasn't the most famous person in the world um he just implemented what he knew and he achieved things and then he became heroic and famous because of what he achieved so yeah, implementation yeah. is the key i think there is a, a fine balance because you know it's like i speak to someone earlier and uh, people are saying look uh, you know the life and death is written and and you know don't worry about these things and stuff like that and i said look at the end of the day it's, it's we know we know that your ajil is fixed but it's the same sharia that's telling you your ajil is fixed that tells you that if you have an illness not to mix with healthy people right or if there's a risk because look at the end of the day i said look imagine it's a cold winter day it's snowing outside do you know what i mean right are you going to um you know have a shower and then just go out in your boxes and your and your vest and say look if i if i catch anything it's from allah anyway you understand you don't do these things you you know there's there's a, because there's rules there's rules of mixing and there's rules of passing it on there's rules of protecting other people but this all comes down to the point where you have to think of other people more than yourself because if you don't think of anyone else and and, and all you can think of is i want to get that last you know pint of guinness in you get me before the the pubs are closed right <laughs> if that's all you make it more relatable to us <laughs> <laughs> you know no i'm talking about non muslim generally let me okay just say like for muslims it may be the case i look i may that's have enough. it i may have it but look at the end of the day, you know before the takeaway is closed you know i want to get the last donut kebab in you get me so at the well, end that is what happened that is what happened mm. that's in, yeah, in, yeah. In birmingham in birmingham torres was rammed mm. yeah even in london east london the halal restaurants they were rammed everyone was out they were all getting their final steak and kebab in it's like and and it, i think it just goes to show how much of this individualistic mm. society the muslims in the west have adopted as well because now they're going there i'm like okay they might exactly. not that was the point i was trying to make earlier that that it's it certainly affected the muslims here um mm. and and another thought i had was that you know people are in isolation at the moment uh with the um quarantine quarantining themselves and that's a moment for people to really reflect and think about things think about life think about the purpose of life but yet these people in this society after it being in us isolation working from home and talking about how they be they're lonely and having to do other things to try and keep themselves occupied they're still going out there like animals really and yeah. raiding the shops and not thinking about anyone else have they not even yeah. sat down and thought for a second the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to isolate himself Allah. even before he received revelation it was a way of contemplating about life and 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 what the purpose is and these people really i don't understand and it, the western ideology has really gripped hold of them to such an extent <laughs> uh assalamu alaikum <laughs> Salah al-Din um, is here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's gripped them to such an extent that they've, they're not even contemplating about these things whilst they're in isolation. No, that's just, to, just to add to that as well, uh, bro, just, you know, um, one thing that I was just uh, reflecting on is they, in this society, they look for distraction. You know how all this, con- this contemplation is natural for man, that we want to know the answers, we want to reflect on the signs of Allah. Uh, it's natural, it's innate in man to do this, but 
what the society has done in, in normal times before coronavirus is all about distraction and um, you know entertainment and it taints the mind that you just want uh, to have that satisfaction so go to the club go to the bar you know watching netflix binge watching right and i was speaking to a few colleagues at work and they were they were you know they were discussing what they're going to do when they're at home alone right and there was they were talking about what what episode can we watch and binge watch uh, while we're in in isolation, what well, and they were giving ideas to each other. That's fine. I'm not I'm not um, being you know, you know, saying something like as though we don't do it and we don't watch TV and so we do, but it does make you reflect that this is a sign from Allah. We should go away and reflect. We should do more to get closer to Allah. And you know they're given lots of these free games and lots of free entertainment uh, mm-hmm. because they know people are going to be uh, stuck in their homes. And it does mm-hmm. make you think that constantly that that industry just wants you to be distracted and yeah, not they, think about those deeper questions. Yeah. Even as the ayat of the, of the Quran, Allah SWT says that, you know, he will, he will, you know, test people, you know, he will send down tests and trials and tribulations so that they return to him. So, you know, the point that you guys mm. were saying, the fact that even though there's this thing that's upon us, this COVID or this, this virus and, and, you know, and people are locked up at home and they can't do these things and it's a moment to reflect, isn't it? Because the whole thing yeah. is about safety, life, death. But if Definitely. people then ignore that, totally ignore that, then at the end of the day, Allah saying, Allah say, look, this is for, to bring you back to Him, right? But mm-hmm. if they if they don't want to heed and and you know take those lessons, then at the end of the day, that's that's ever that's everyone's fault. The, the 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 signs are clear, but we choose to ignore them. But I want this this actually nicely go moves on to my next question. Okay, so do you guys think? That this is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I mean, there's talk about the, uh, the Chinese being punished Because of what they're doing in uh, uh, East Turkestan and, and, and whatnot But do you think that this is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I, I don't Well, I, I don't know whether we can say, to be honest Because if you think about it You know, this argument that the Chinese are being punished Initially, you know, when it was initially mainly in China a few months ago, uh, this was a bit of a convenient thing to say because, um, you know, they, they are, let's not, there's no denying it, they are oppressing a lot of the Muslims in that area. But um, to say it, two things for me that kind of debunk this view is firstly, even they say that even the Muslims in China were affected by COVID-19 as well. So if, if it's a punishment, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish those that are being you know, already being oppressed, first point. Second point, COVID-19 is global now. No, there's an argument whether it even started in China. We can probably talk about that a little bit. But, you know, there's a global pandemic. Multiple countries are being affected, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So we can't, you know, we can't say, I don't think we can say, it's Allah Alam, Allah knows best. But I think one thing we can say is that it really highlights the might and power of Allah. That, SubhanAllah, one micro smallest of microbes uh, you know brought the world to a standstill brought the whole nations to a standstill um, economic collapse and all of this and it really one thing I was thinking about you know the story of Nimrud uh, this in you know, a tyrant you know what destroyed him a mosquito you know a mosquito went through you know, I don't know how authentic it is but a mosquito went into his uh, went through his nose and you know and it caused him to die so subhanAllah it just shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the might and the power to impact us all uh, through the smallest of things. So yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't think we can, with certainty, say it's a punishment, yeah. but, it, but we can reflect on it. I'd agree with that. You, we can't. We can't delve into uh, the ghayb. This is uh, the, in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Why you know why this has happened? Um, I mean, somebody. Uh, the point. The initial point that you made, J.K. Um, somebody could argue against that, and because Allah mentions in the Quran that um, his 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 curse can befall over a nation, even if there are righteous people there, and it will the divine scour- scourge will uh, affect even the righteous in that area. But I mean, that, so I wouldn't use that argument um, to kind of debunk this uh, this idea. But uh, the bottom line is, we don't know whether something whether Allah is punishing. A nation or, or not and, and the fact is it's it's affecting everybody now around not just in China so um, somebody can't argue that this is a, a punishment sent to the, the Chinese people by Allah um, but for us as Muslims we need to see it as 
two, we can we can deal with this in two ways. We can either um, you know move further away from Allah and start asking questions like, "Oh, why is Allah doing this? Why is you know if somebody close to you has died from this? Why is Allah?" and start questioning it. Or we can start moving closer and see it as a blessing. Actually, it's a chance for us to now just step away from the the fast life and just you know sit down and let's think about things a little bit reflect about your life and what you're doing you know a lot of people might have been involved in things that were haram actually now might have have some chance to think about it the western life is so fast paced you know you get swept up in it and it might allow some people to just start reflecting a bit more and actually move closer to allah and this may be a blessing so yeah yeah that's, I agree. that's the way i view yeah, I don't, I don't think you can answer that question whether it's um, it's a punishment or not from Allah. Uh, one thing that you can definitely say is that it's a it's a test from Allah. So, and this is whether somebody's affected by it or not. So, it it reminded me of uh, the Prophet Ayub and his story. Um, I can't remember. Um, I can't remember the the number of years off the top of my head, but. Um, maybe you can fill it in in the comments at some point, but he he lived a very prosperous life and you know he he had a great business he was very wealthy, he had lots of children um, you know beautiful children, strong children and you know uh, I won't go into the finer details about how you know Shaitan wanted to impose his test and Allah allowed it but slowly slowly these things got taken away from him and he lost his business, he lost his children. And then he lost his health and, you know, he's now lost everything that everybody generally uh, prizes so much. You know, your, your wealth, your children um, and your health. He's, he's now bedridden. Not, not has he been bedridden for a few months. He's been bedridden now for seven years. And Shaitan came to his wife and said, you know, you, you had such an amazing life with your husband and, you know, look at what it's what it's come to. Can you not ask Allah to ease the punishment a little bit? And uh, you know, there was a tricky bit there because you have to assume that it's a punishment. And Prophet Ayub's uh, response to her was, you know, I had a I had blessings for years upon years. If I remember correctly, it was about sixty years. So he lived for sixty years with blessings upon blessings, and for seven years, he's he's now been in some troublesome situation and and he said look i've only had it for seven years why should i complain i had so many blessings beforehand now it, it reminds me of his story but equally so you can turn it around and if we look at the case of the muslims in palestine and in and in kashmir i don't believe they have any cases there and they're actually cut off from the rest of the world and you know who would have thought that you know given the amount of talk that there is about Kashmir and Palestine, it's actually the rest of the world that's in need of their du'as, not the other way around, For even for a moment. It's, it's actually the other way around now. So, yeah, that's that. There was one case uh, uh, in Gaza, uh, okay. I, saw, I saw today, and, and, and obviously that will be quite difficult because those people are really close to each other. But, but the thing is also, yeah, I mean, what you guys said there is bang on, to be honest with you. Um, even if it is a punishment for people, it does. And Khairu pointed out uh, that uh, even other people, good people, will you know be uh, involved in the the punishment, or you say a punishment, okay? But the reality is, is that you know, if for example, if you think about uh, the Prophet Saleh, uh, alayhi salam, you know, for example, the decision to kill the camel, Naqatullah, was made by a handful of people. But the other people, they sort of allowed it, or whether even they didn't. But the, when the when the when the punishment came, it came on everyone. But the point is, though, is that for we would never know. But you know that one because Allah tells you this punishment in the Quran. So whether it is a punishment, whether it isn't, for the believer, you know, um, it's a it's a trial, it's a test. You know, he may be amongst people who are being punished. How does he react to it? Does he question his iman? Does he question his his Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I, you know, I always pray salah. I've never missed a salah in my life. You know, I've always been good. I give sadaqah. I give all these things. 
why is Allah putting me through this? And, and the example that uh, Brother Adris gave there, which is a really good reminder, to be honest with you, it's been a while since I read that story, but it really is bang on where even when Iblis was trying to get through to the Prophet through his wife and say, look, you know, does Allah really love you? You know, why would he have done this to you if that was the case? You know, so that's why there are people out there who blatantly say, look, this is a punishment on China. Allah alam, you get me, obviously, the people that are... Uh, the people that are doing what they are doing to the Muslims, yeah, yeah, they do deserve punishment. And I'll say that, you know, because what's happening in places like China, what's happening in Kashmir, in Palestine, these are, you're not talking about, these are crimes crimes against humanity in a way. And what I mean, what I mean by that is the fact that what's been happening to these people is where these people are not considered to be human beings. You know, it's like these people have lost the mercy from their hearts. So if people have lost the mercy from the hearts, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to be merciful on them? But Allah, Allah, we don't know. So, you know, moving on, um, how do you think this, this virus has affected Muslims? Whether it's the people that you, are, uh, you interact with, because if you think about what's happened, it has been a bit of a rude awakening for a lot of people in the sense that, you know, just say what's happening in China. In China, you can't even have a beard, you can't have a Muslim name, you can't fast. You, the masjids are, are being changed into bars and stuff. You know, you look at places where there's curfews, like, you know, in, I, I don't think the Jamia Masjid in Srinagar in Kashmir has even opened since the time when they closed it, right? And a lot of us take things just like going to the masjid as granted, to be taken for granted, right? But now it's like a bit of a rude awakening for a lot of us where, subhanAllah, you know, there's no Juma for the first time and people are sending messages around how, how heartbroken they feel, but the Ummah has been feeling like this in places like that for, for a long time. You understand? You know? yeah. But how do you think this has affected the Muslims and how do you think the Muslims, this might even shape, could this be a moment in history where it's going to shape the Muslim psyche? I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Well, just to bounce your question back at you for a moment, couldn't you say that that's a punishment for, on us that we're not able to go to the mosque anymore? First thing I'd say, is don't ask the host questions, bro. <laughs> right? <laughs> but nah, uh, bro, but that's the point though, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a realization. The fact that yeah. you had it, like what you were saying, the example of uh, the prophet, he had it, didn't he? You know, but he was a prophet, obviously. The point I'm making is the fact that there's a lot of things whether, you know, it's just mingling with people. And think about it, bro, subhanAllah, I wasn't even taking this thing seriously. I'll be honest with you, right? But, this could go into Ramadan. If people are if people are thinking, you know what, we can't go to pray the normal salah, the masjid, imagine when Tarawih is going to be called off. As an example, if it is around that time, and the way it looks like it, it could well be. You understand? Bro, Eid as well. Eid. Eid as well. Eid mm. as well. Yeah, I mean, all the, all the, you know, the Japan and all the, the hogs and stuff yeah. on Eid, you know, you're going to have to definitely do the Aywala style. But, <laughs> yeah. but that, that, that's what I think of. Whether it's, whether it's someone thinks of it as a punishment or not, you know, uh, but I do see your point because if you think about it, uh, Adris, you know, when someone is going to the masjid, you get more reward, don't you? Mm-hmm. So that reward time. aspect, that, that opportunity is is like is like not there. You know, like for the people that used to go on Umrah, the people like Hajj for you, bro, yo, listen, we talking about we talking about Eid, bro, Hajj. You know, whether it, whether it drags on Allah Allah, we don't know. But uh, yeah. but I'm I'm not sure, bro. But yeah, uh, J.K., you're gonna make a point, I think. No, uh, you know, I, I think it has affected us definitely. You can't we can't deny has it affected our lives definitely in the West especially. Uh, you know, Juma Juma being cancelled. I went to the last Juma, Subhanallah, and I don't know whether I should have, but the mosque had opened right, so I, had to, I felt like I had to go. But Subhanallah, if this lasts for a while, then multiple Jummas, and we know the blessing of Juma. You know, the sins between the two Jummas. Or you know the minor sins they are forgiven. So a lot of this blessing that we had, as you know, we might not have anymore. And you know, as long as our niyah is there, who knows? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala may may give it to, give it to us. Yeah. Um, exactly. So I think I think it has impacted us. But one thing that may, made me reflect on is has it really impacted the Muslims of Syria, of Kashmir, of these places? And, and I'm not talking about whether they've got it or not. I'm talking about you know. Their situation of isolation, their situation of lockdown, their situation of fear of not having food in the supermarkets, not being able to even do Ramadan properly. I remember that picture of Gaza where this family was, you know, iftar in this, you know, burnt out house, right? And these these are constant images we see every Ramadan. And it is a rude awakening to us that 
subhanallah, the ummah has been going through this situation for ages. And only now we're getting, even, you know, I'm living in comfort here. Subhanallah, I've got my iPhone here. I've got my you know, laptop. I'm living in comfort. Subhanallah, there's nothing to complain about. But it has affected me because it's not the same way I live. But um, these, these uh, communities and the Muslims of Kashmir and Palestine, they've been going at it. And the, the difference really is, you know, their situation is inflicted on them by human beings, by uh, governments. Western governments have inflicted, and Israel, you know, they, they've inflicted this situation on the Muslims, on humanity. Whereas this natural situation, no one's really inflicted it. Um, whether, you know, there is an argument to say it, it came out of a lab and, you know, it was a mistake. But I, I, don't, I don't have the view that someone's deliberately, you know, created coronavirus and, and spread it. Um, you know, this is a natural phenomenon. And it really just, it's a sobering moment that yeah it has affected me and it has changed my life for a little bit but the muslims they were going through this for for a while you know yeah. you know, considering this chain of events this should have uh, a new found level of respect for every single person in the world for refugees for what they go through because this is a virus and look at the state of the world you know uh, shelves are empty um healthcare falling apart the armies being deployed to control their own people. Armies are used to protect people, not not to you know defend, not to literally protect them from each other, but from um, outside threat. And, and these armies are being deployed internally. So that if you consider what refugees go through to leave their homeland, you know at the moment we we're struggling to go to Lidl and Tesco to get a bottle of milk. As like if you consider what they have to go through to travel miles and miles to go to another place to try and re reset their lives that 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 should put refugees on 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 a higher level than the majority of uh, of humanity in any if anything it's about perspective as well isn't it i mean yes it's affected muslims here uh, in line with what you guys have been saying yes it's affected um what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis but how much you know you see the the muslims who are really um, affected by the masjids closing. Of course, that's a, it's, it's the heart of our communities, the masjids. Um, but it's happened in the past. And in fact, there's evidence for this, where the Prophet has uh, advised the Sahaba to, to, not, to pray in their homes when there's, you know, in these type of times, um, when there's going to be some sort of harm or risk. But, you know, you see Muslims who are yearning for the masjids to be reopened or they're waiting on, you know, when is the masjid going to be reopened again? How many of the Muslims are yearning for the re-establishment of Allah's deen on this land, in, in this world? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a comparison we need to make that, let's put this into perspective. You know, there's, uh, the Ummah is going through something unprecedented at the moment. We are living in times that for 1300 years of our history, we had we had an Islamic system, and we had the, the 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 laws of Islam and the Sharia of Allah implemented, and over for for over you know for almost a hundred years now, this has been um, uh, absent. Uh, we need to be looking at it from that perspective, and not really. I I think it's again affected Muslims because of again individualism has affected them. They're just thinking about how. Things are affecting them here in the West, but let's look at the wider picture here. We've been going through misery for the last hundred years. Plus, why are we not think? Why are Muslims not thinking about that? I think what and it I is. I think the, re the reason. Sorry, go on, much. I was just going to say that, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, especially uh, Muslims in the West. You know, obviously, we can't speak for the Muslims in the in the Muslim lands because we can see that they're yearning for. For Islam and a lot of the stuff that's been uh, being done to them is because of the fact that they're yearning for Islam. But I think uh, for us here in the West, you know, the fact that it's a, it's it's hit our it's affected our own stomachs, the fact that it's affected our own well-being, uh, that's the reason why people are becoming proactive. But Alhamdulillah, you know, the thing is though, yeah, there may be element of selfishness, but the thing is, is that you know, it has to start somewhere, doesn't it? And you know, this could be that this could be that kickstart because one thing that the West Western societies do very well is they hide the reality of life 
and they hide the reality of death to the extent that you know you go to the supermarkets you know if you go to the aisle of where the meat is you know you'll see a chicken there nice and glossy you know what i mean yeah not a single feather on it not a single no snooze not a single sign of blood why because this society the people in the society are soft for them they don't want to think about death you understand and the muslims it's affected us too you know but then what happens is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us a reminder you know through whether it's a virus like this and and ultimately people are trying to protect themselves from the virus but virus equals death from their point of view right so it is one of those things that you know it could could wake us up but you're right because you know i, I always say that muslims don't even need they don't just need the sharia whilst they're alive they need it whilst they're dead you know if you think about it subhanallah man in this country certainly in the west you know first and foremost you swan dies you know there's a big chance that you're going to go through autopsy you know son they're going to cut you up they're going to open you up you know get your thing inside that and then throw them back in sew you up and now subhanallah because of this coronavirus there's cases where you know the local councils have said we're going to cremate these people yeah. right mm-hmm. or there's been cases where people have died and their families not have not were not able to attend the burial and it was just the people from you know the the all the white suits and stuff and they buried the people right so i think what's what's important is uh you know when people are agitated they give you an ear why because they feel that they have a problem and they look for solutions so right now what we can say is alhamdulillah i think one of the purpose of this podcast as an example is that you know there are people who are confused what's happening you what should we do you know but and the reality is is that yeah one angle is just stay home and read quran but the other angle is that like what you're saying khairul is actually look into what is islam itself why are we in this situation okay we may be feeling like we are today like we can't leave the home but our brothers and sisters around the world that's happened that's been happening for decades why yeah. why why are we better than them that we only give a crap when it's it's us that are affected why are they in that situation and hopefully, and, and in time i guess you will arrive at the the conclusion but just 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 moving on Shall there's a couple more questions i've got and you know we will uh, we'll bring this the podcast to a close um is that what do you think the political implications of the coronavirus is because this is a worldwide phenomena right uh, obviously there's a you know it's the chinese it's the chinese virus so there are you know <laughs> you, there are implications where the chinese have been pointing the finger at the us um other people have been pointing the fingers at china what do you guys think the political implications of this of what's happening now you know is anything going to change is this a, a like a a a moment in history where I think the the political establishment some people are talking about revolutions and maybe they watch too many movies but do you think you know what do you think the political implications are yeah just to answer that from my perspective i think it's important as muslims we need to look at this like a wider angle as well of course it's impacted our daily lives and there's conversations about the masjids being closed and these are important as in you know as a community it's important but we should also think about the the wider longer term implications and like you said the what's the political or economic implications um and i think as you, as i've said before like it really highlights some of the different systems and you know china um, the the stance they've taken yeah lots of people have died right even in south korea and other uh, that area you know they were former <laughs> like communist uh countries right i know they're capitalist now but they they still have some remnants of the principles of of communism and socialism and because of this this fact actually people uh, the governments act differently the governments have been acting slightly differently of what they've implemented um different to how the west have done as well and a lot of people are now questioning that is capitalism and this freedom the system of freedom does it now have to implement certain socialist ideas of you know enforcing lockdown enforcing this don't do this don't do that um and it is really interesting to see that and it really highlights that capitalism is compromise there's no true form of capitalism or democracy is all there's always limits to freedom there's always these and now the limits seem to be a bit more a higher bar uh, but the other the other thing um you know it'll take a bit of, a lot of time so we can't go into the depth of this but you know looking at the reaction of politicians so trump he has constantly been talking about being the the chinese virus or the uh, the wuhan virus 
Um, but there's evidence to say that actually it was created in the US. So, you know, uh, and you know, there was a mistake uh, in the, one of the labs and, and it got released in this way. Um, and, 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 you know, there's lots of evidence to say that even before the first case in Wuhan, um, there, were, there was stuff in, that kicked off in America um, with, their, with their army and things like this and, and how they actually took it to China in that Wuhan region when, when there were the military games happening there. So I don't want to go too much detail, but it does show that uh, we do need to look at some of the depth of this and what it will mean for uh, going forward for these countries. Yeah, yeah what's, what's interesting about that is that um, it's difficult to say it for sure because we don't know the factual evidence as, you know, if, if that is a fact. But there are certain um, media outlets um, that are talking about how actually, yeah, this virus may have originated from a lab in America. But what we can certainly do is look at the reaction, political reaction. What's very um, uh, suspicious is how um, Trump and the US are um, trying to pin the blame on China, how then Boris Johnson has come out and um, praised some of the senators who are calling for the, the punishment of China. And they really, it sounds politically, it sounds like they're trying to pin something on, on China here. And that should raise alarm bells because we know these politicians uh, and the media outlets that they control, um, we, can't, we can't always believe them. When, when there's such a push on, on something, there has to be something underlying. There's a reason why they're trying to do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, so we can't really say uh, what's going to happen politically, though. I hope that um, it, it uh, enable, or it forces people in the West to start questioning their ideology. How can yeah. something so small have caused such a devastating effect on their way of life? And surely they must be thinking, okay, now the governments are completely going against pure form of capitalism and looking towards more socialist elements in terms of how they're now talking about paying 80% of uh, employees' wages here in the UK, um, you know, having police uh, and military lockdowns out there and rationing and that kind of thing, stuff, really going against their own ideologies. Now, is that going to, for hopefully that, that creates some sort of questioning in the minds of uh, the non-Muslims and the, uh, those in the West and start thinking about some alternative um, yeah. systems. And, and, you know, and, and, really, it's crazy, just politically, but also economically, what kind of economic effect it can have if this continues for, for months and, uh, you know, if it goes into yeah. 12, 12 months plus, um, economically, it could be devastating for their, for their economies. I mean, it already has. They've been they've been bailing out the, the banks and the Fed and the BO Bank of England. They've been pumping in uh, quantitative easing, they call it. Yeah. Uh, they're pumping in money, printing money, uh, to to help the cash flow of these companies and these banks. So that who has to pay for that? That's us, not yeah. not me and you, but I mean the taxpayer, the, the general public. So, you know, we need to highlight these things because it does really expose this system that looks yeah. out for capitalists, but who's questioning the fact that they have underfunded the NHS for years, leading to lack of ventilation, lack of beds, uh, because they don't care about the general public. They care about their own uh, elitist capitalist back pockets. Adris? I was going to say there's a, a Sky News headline that said um, capitalism is on hold. And it just made me think, <laughs> why not just be honest and say capitalism is failing? Yeah. Because it is. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, like what Khairul said there as well, and it really is a fantastic point. And and actually, what you guys are saying really is that this is an opportunity for people to to maybe voice their their um, opinions on on the system. But what we have seen is that when something is man made, it's gonna be imperfect, imperfect. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, it's gonna have, you know, uh, it's gonna have limitations. It's gonna be flawed. So what we see is that true capitalism, Subhanallah, if true capitalism was being implemented today, there would be riots. There yeah. would be people being the, killed. There would be politicians being dragged out of their homes and lynched <laughs> on the street. Yeah. And what we see is that even when the economic crisis happened a while back, when they bailed out the banks. You know, in capitalism, if you're not efficient, then basically you have no right to those limited resources that you hold 
You understand? Exactly. They need to go somewhere else. You need to you need to pack up and, and get out of there, right? But they bail out the banks. And what we see now is all this thing about the mortgages and what you gotta understand is capitalism, it doesn't entertain any other value other than the materialistic value, right? There's yeah. no humanitarian value in it whatsoever. So to them, but it just goes to show that the system is flawed. And and but the only thing is is that right now even if people think about an alternative, if they think about an alternative, even if you think about in schools, they talk about communism, even though it's defunct, <laughs> and capitalism. Yeah. They talk about the communist uh, uh, economic system and the capitalist economic system. But why is it that they don't, they don't even make a mention of a system that was being implemented for almost 1,400 years, which had a record of removing poverty as an example right they don't entertain that and the problem is is that yeah. even though the people live a life where the normal people they know they're being dealt with they know there's a famous saying the rich get richer and the poor get poorer but there's no alternative and that's the thing if there was an alternative today these people are really in need of this you know but the thing is there isn't so the people at the top the money makers they have an open hand right now. They can do yeah. what they want. So, you know, I think the last question I want to bring on, obviously there's an element of what the economic damage will be, but you guys can touch upon that if you want to. But I think there's a good point at this stage to, to talk about, you know, we talked about this other system. We talked about this alternative, okay? So if there was a, a, an Islamic state, if there was Islam being established somewhere on this world, either there would be a Khilafah, there would be the middle mu'mineen, okay? How different would uh, the state of the Muslims dealt with yeah. something like the coronavirus? Uh, can I tell you that? Yeah, just to, I think that's a really good question because, you know, um, people that may be listening to the podcast, watching the podcast, they okay. may ask this, they may have this view that, you know, we're, we're, we're given a hard time to capitalism, we're, we're, you know, rinsing it basically for what it is. Um, what is the alternative? You know, explain what that is. And it's a, it's a great question. How would Islam deal with it? And it is a bit hypothetical because it doesn't exist. The Islamic system doesn't exist today. Um, it did exist, but it, it doesn't today. And most countries follow the system of capitalism. But um, the, the way I view it is the, the way Islam looks at the economic system and the, the, the you know, keeping the society good and the wellness of society, um, it's very different to the capitalist system, right? Um, I'm just sorry to go into the economics of it, but now go to the economy. You're going to the economics. That'd be good. Yeah. So, so the economic problem, from a capitalist viewpoint, is viewed as there's too many wants and needs to satisfy uh, the limited resources. Yeah. So why why is it that you find the shelves are empty? Because the way the person views it is, mm. I need and want all of these toilet rolls. I need and want all of this pasta for myself. Yeah. Uh, whereas with uh, a Muslim and the Muslim, uh, the way Islam looks at economics is not about needs and wants. We look at it on the basis of needs. There's a limited number of needs. You know, I, I can want as much as I want. I can have unlimited wants, but there's a limited number of needs to survive. So the Islamic viewpoint is how do we distribute the limited amount of material out, the resource out there, so that everybody in the whole society has, has the basic necessities. And the Do you basic mean needs. basic needs? Yeah, I mean to survive, to have basic food. Needs, yeah. to, so the, yeah, so basic Islam, needs, Islam differentiates right? between basic needs and then yeah. everything else as, exactly. as, as, as a want, not a need. As a want, not a need. That's, a, that's the precise point. Whereas in capitalism, they merge both together. You know, it's all about what you need and want. It's, it's one, one group. Um, and, and the reason that's important is, um, so the way an Islamic state would have dealt with this problem is that First and foremost, they would already have the ability uh, and uh, have extra resource in place for something like this. So in Turkey, for example, uh, which, which isn't an Islamic system, but it has some of the remnants of the previous social system, the previous economic system, right? And one of the things you've seen there is that the people want to help each other out. They have sufficient number of beds in the hospitals. They're putting out, um, what's it called, sanitizer on the streets, you know, they're thinking about the people and making sure the people have these basic necessities. Um, and that's, that's not even an Islamic system, all right? But it gives you a bit of a, uh, you know, you can see, uh, visualize how it would work in Islam where 
it will be more about satisfying everyone's needs and looking after your neighbor. Each individual wouldn't be thinking about his own greed. He'd be thinking about his neighbor's surrounding and his community. And I think that's the way, uh, if, if it existed today, that's how we would deal with this coronavirus problem. Yes, it was, um, JK was just mentioning about um, um, the, uh, the Western, the, the capitalist economic system. And actually, it's built on the premise of there are limited resources with unlimited needs. So, of course, the people are going to react in the way that they're reacting. They're thinking, oh, gosh, there's limited resources here. I need to go and stock up because it's all going to run out. But then when you go into the supermarkets, they're trying to reassure everyone on the tannoy, please don't panic buy, please, there's enough for everybody to go around. But it's their ideology and their system that itself that's causing this type of panic because it's built on this false premise that we have limited resources for unlimited needs. In fact, we've got enough resources in this whole world to, to cater for 60 billion, not just the six or seven billion that we have uh, on earth. 60 billion, boy, that's a big number, bro. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what I would say is that what you have to understand is the Islam, the Sharia, came to deal with human problems. You understand? So no one understands humans, the creation, better than the creator himself. So what we see is that, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, Wealth, uh, what's called uh, uh, JK, you know, wealth distribution, wealth oh, distribution, distribution, hoarding, for example, is haram. Uh, but also, what you're going to understand is there are times when there are rules within Islam which make it flexible. Okay, hmm. this isn't this isn't like from capitalism and saying that oh yeah, we're also flexible. No, no, here for capitalism is actually going against his actual principles in what is doing, what is doing now, right? What we're talking about, for example, the time of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, right? When he was a Khalifa, what did he do? He suspended the hadood for the chopping of the hand. And why? This wasn't something that he made up. He understood that this is from the Sharia itself, right? Mm. So, uh, and, and also uh, one, one story from that time, I can't remember. Um, which companion it was but one companion at the time he said that you know the time when that famine happened he basically what he said was that he said that i was surprised that people didn't come out with their swords and in a way what he also said was that if people did come out with their swords you would have understood why because there was a famine i.e no one no one came out no one robbed anyone there wasn't highway robberies. There wasn't, you know, what I'm trying to say, right? And the, yeah. he was saying, I was surprised that this never happened. Why? Because the Islamic state is a state that's built on taqwa. Yeah. It's a connection between yeah. you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And yeah. when you're living in this society, then subhanAllah, these trials and tribulations, you deal with them as a community, as an ummah, right? Yeah. But in the West, you are purely individuals who are who, and, and and even your interaction with other people is for your own benefit, right? Mm, you understand? Okay. It's for your own benefit. It's, it's you, it's me, myself, and I, okay? And that's the big difference. And and why wouldn't it be, if you think about it, one is a system which has been produced by the limited mind, whilst the other is a system that comes, you know, from the one who is the master, who is the king of kings the master of creation, the one who created everything, he understands very well. And he also tells us that he's going to test us with hunger, with poverty, you know, son, so that we have taqwa. And I'll tell you one other thing as well, is that, you know, when people, people would call this a fitna. And, you know, I can't remember the exact Arabic terminology, but the word fitna, it derives from uh, the, the Arabic word of this, the smelting process. You know, I don't know if you know about the smelting process where you have the gold or you have like yeah. a metal and it goes through a process where the impurities, they are removed. And what remains is the, the pure material, pure. the mm. pure gold or whatever it is, right? So, you know, the fitna is a way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is purifying us of our sins. He's purifying us so that on the day of Yom al Qiyamah, on the day of judgment, we stand in front of Him pure. You understand? But this is only the case if we have tawakkul. 
if we have yakin if we have the, we have, if we have the taqwa right and and that's something which is really important obviously uh address needs to become a dictator in his home but uh <laughs> mashallah nuruddin zangi is here as well now but uh yeah so that's just the the the, the example that we have between the islamic state as an example and the the uh, the capitalist system and hence why like you said jk islam deals with the whole issue from a different angle yeah um, just to one one other one to add to that was um, yeah. well, the other thing i'm reflecting have you, i don't know whether you saw in the uk the uh the guy else's name said he can the mayor of london he's had to come out and uh you know, urge like emergency message to the people to follow the advice of not going out to public gatherings, not going to pubs and restaurants, and not congregating, um, because the people aren't following the rules. Like I said, and when you think about the Islamic uh, system, you know, even the the, the the principle in Islam is that if the Caliph orders something, even if it's not uh, from the Quran directly, if he's made an order, the people have to follow. It's a Sharia rule that you have to follow as long as it's halal. Uh, you have to follow what the, the Khalif is saying. So if the Khalif now said everyone stay in their homes and no one leave, the taqwa and the understanding a Muslim has is that in Islam, to obey Allah is to obey those of, in authority as well. Mm. So as Allah says, uh, you know, Ati um, sorry, obey Allah, obey the Messenger and those in authority amongst, amongst you. you. So, so in this principle, you, you know, it, we, we need to enforce it because the people themselves want to follow the leader. Whereas in this system, uh, when the leaders say no one listens, they have to send the army out, they have to send the police out, and even still, there's going to be still issues with uh, people listening to advice. Yeah, subhanAllah. And, uh, but again, mm-hmm. like I said, you know, the, 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 the state in Islam is built on, on taqwa. Uh, and what you have to understand is that, you know, in reality, you know, a society has rules and regulations and obviously people live according to them right and those rules and regulations are those rules they come from a system which those people want to live according to right and what should happen normally is that the state interferes when someone breaks a rule you understand someone breaks a rule the 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 the, the society in a way should be sort of self-regulating so we see in that in in islam you know, for example, we have so much uh, emphasis on uh, looking after, your, looking out for your neighbor, for your community, for each other, right? So, and and also enjoying the good, forbid the evil, enjoying the good, forbid the evil. Yes, it's done at a state level, but also it's done on the individual level in your uh, in your capacity, right? So, when you're living in a society like this, the state will interfere when someone is doing something which is affecting other people. Okay, uh, but what you understand is in societies where you're telling the people that we are freedom, you are free to do what you want. You are free to, uh, if you want to believe that you're a you're a tree, if you want to believe that you're a dog, then that's your right. You can believe what you want. You can do what you want. Now you're putting this in their head, and then all of a sudden you're saying to them, "Yo, listen, you can't be going out." Now for them. There's okay, some people might abide by that because of, of their own fears, but other people are like, Look, at the end of the day, nah, this is just rumors, it's just you know, it's just uh, uh, made up because the new world order and the governments are trying to uh, trap us, and you know, we got to revolt. And, and the people are not going to listen, why? Because they don't really care, they only abide by the system when it, it's in their favor. But like you mentioned, bro, to us, the Khalifa. You know, he's like a rep. The Khalifa is is the successor to the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So the same way, if the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ordered something, we would follow. The Khalifa is in the same way, so we would follow the Khalifa, even though there may be you know short term uh, harm to us in a way. Just say, but you would do it. Why? Because you're doing it because Allah subhanahu wa taala has made him the representative of His Deen on this world. And you are by, by you obeying him, you are obeying Allah and His Messenger. Exactly. And when you have that mentality, you won't be you won't be breaking these laws. You won't need you won't need cameras in like nursing homes, you know, where you get footages of of carers beating beating old people up in their homes when no one's watching, or when in these 
in these nurseries where you see what these people are doing with these kids, you will need these secret hidden cameras. Why? Because the taqwa is something that connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you will need all these hidden things because if you believe that Allah is watching you anyway, why would you fear a camera in the corner? Right? But anyway, inshallah, I think what we should do is uh, bring this uh, podcast uh, to a, a close, but it will do it in a natural, natural way. So, you know, we spoke about the coronavirus and uh, Alhamdulillah, you guys have made some really fantastic points. There was one question that I saw on, because my daughter was doing a Facebook, no, uh, Instagram live. And one brother asked a question and I really want a quick answer and then we'll, we'll move on towards the end. Is that what he said was that, well, what he asked is that uh, the fact that the uh, Mecca Haram is closed, is this a sign of Yom Al-Qiyamah? So I thought I'd ask that because, you know, the brother uh, asked the question. Um, obviously, we don't know, do we? In the sense, like, there's there's lots of signs of Qiyamah. I guess, yeah. you know, uh, this is, maybe it's one, Allah Alam. Anyway. Allah <laughs> Alam, yeah. so, you, you just answered the question yourself, so I don't know <laughs> from us now. Bro, if you guys are just sitting there watching me, you know what I mean? i got to say something, isn't it? Yeah, but okay, no. let's move so, on. There. So, one, so One quick point, though, I wanted to yeah. quickly make was um, in regards to what you were, uh, the previous question that you were asking is that um, in Islam, the, 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 the life of a Muslim is sacred. So whatever the Islamic uh, governance at the time, you know, the, the Khalifa um, decides, the Muslims understand that the life of a Muslim is sacred. So whatever per, um, procedure, uh, what do you call it, like... Um, uh, or whatever um, type of rules that come out in place by uh, the Khalifa is part of it. The Muslims will understand that this is because we're trying to protect the life of Muslims, and so that's why they will there'll be even more of a, a concerted effort by the Muslims from themselves to try and pro- make sure that they're not causing harm to others because it's, it's an Islamic concept, fundamental Islamic concept that we all hold. Yeah, I mean, obviously here you have expediency. The the fact that the discussion is that look, you know, guys so, about, can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, it's a good point, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so the only thing I was going to add to that, Khairul, is the fact that you know reflection is you you're completely correct, and it will do what it needs to in order to achieve that. Whilst just say now, um, you know, we have a, 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 a de- the debate now is that who deserves to live and who deserves to die so we have like limited beds limited ventilators we can't save everyone so let the you know the 60 70 year olds you know if anything they're bloody burdened because you know we're going to get pensions out and stuff like that. let's get rid of them first right and then the people who are who are going to be able to contribute into the economy they're going to fill the pockets of the people that the the, the, the top the the capitalists then uh, let's try to save them because you know they'll just be uh, contributing to the yeah. to to the system so think, this yeah. this is something in islam which you would never come to come to that case because whether you're 70 your life is sacred or whether you're 15 your life is sacred exactly. yes Adris. Yeah. yeah i was going to say that that that's one area where it does expose capitalism where it's purely based on benefit and right. uh you know anyone who brings something to the table yeah you're worth it anyone who doesn't you're you're not worth it and it, it is a it's a horrible and harsh approach to, because from an Islamic, Islamic perspective, uh, an older person in general is more honorable and yeah. not for, for so many different reasons. Their, their parents or, or you know, fathers, mothers, um, whether they work or not, and, and even if they don't work, they deserve it. They, they raised us. You know, at, at the end of the day, if you th- if, for those of you who do have kids, um, uh, if, and, and if you don't know when you do, you'll find that you have a newfound level of respect for your parents the moment you have a newborn that arrives. And that's because you now begin to appreciate every step, every night, every day that they spent, as in your parents spent with you to mm-hmm. raise you. And yeah. as, as time goes by, you only gain more respect for your parents. So from an Islamic perspective, this is, this is natural because you have to take care of your parents. But not only that, but Islam does legislate for this situation 
and and generally for people as well because uh, i think capitalism or uh, and, and secularism they don't recognize uh, how to balance the relationship between individuals and society they they say it's impractical it can't happen whereas is islam it does and it does legislate for it as well now although although we don't have hilafa today um some of the rules we can do our best to implement them at the end of the day they're not going to fully function until we do uh you know have the entire system in place but yeah you, yeah people should take the necessary measures as in even even look, look juma is one of those things that the professor some is the only thing that professor some said if you if you miss it three times in a row you need to you know uh revisit iman again basically you you've got to make sure that you know you're still on track now that is cancelled at the moment we can't pray juma now there's other rights as well like visiting the sick visiting the elderly you know making taking care of the poor these are all rights um that that everybody has but you you can't you're not in a position to implement them uh but the smaller ones as in taking care of your neighbor um they are important and the um you know the the, the sayings the the interpretations or the understandings of the narration say that when you know when we're ordered to take care of our neighbor what that means is that if your neighbor goes a night without food in their stomach and they're hungry maybe they couldn't afford it or they don't have it you're accountable for it mm. so yeah. if we consider the amount of muslims that there are out there who might be hoarding or might have like i don't want to go into their intentions I and mean, you've seen some videos of people you know trolleys stacked high with rice and flour and so on and as much as that might look alarming for all we know that man is is buying enough food to feed his entire street and he's going to be preparing food to feed his entire street i hope he is i really do hope he is if it's just for himself then then yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't be permissible um Dad. but salahuddin is really keen for my attention at the moment but <laughs> i think there's a there's a there's a point there's a point even even with this is that the biggest worry at the moment for most people is how they're going to provide Dad. for their families at the end of the day yeah Dad. and <laughs> your bike's making issues in the kitchen okay i'll move on <laughs> so the, the thing is is that everybody's really concerned about how you know how they're going to concentrate or how they're going to be productive with work um kids kids are a blessing there's plenty of other distractions at work that you can you know get rid of and make use of um maybe maybe it's a it's a, it's a blessing for us as muslims to give us more opportunity to spend with our families and maybe we needed that to uh, appreciate some of the things that we do have because now now it does does just go to prove that the things that we probably thought were essential whether it is you know you might have lost your job or been made redundant but now that's not even the most important thing right now is keeping your family safe and you know doing other things that are more important and maybe this is what it takes for people to realize that to realize what the important things are mashallah obviously let's uh, let's move on before the podcast uh, disconnects again <laughs> but, <laughs> but now uh, some bros the, in a, the the my points you made there i can't address because there's so many and there's so many valid ones i mean it's a lot of things that you know we we take for granted um and we sh- in these times we should appreciate it, whether, whether it's our parents whether it's our co- uh, kids or whether it's the time that we might be we might have now inshallah taala but um get i was going to i was going to say to get everyone's final thoughts i think i think a brother adris has given his final final thoughts there um so you know i'll just um, ask the other two uh start with jk uh your uh, your final yeah. thoughts on on uh, on the coronavirus and 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 stuff like yeah. that and maybe advice or something so i mean we've we've discussed lots so alhamdulillah i think it has been a good good podcast but just the one one final point from me i think um as muslims you know we will protect from physical harm you know um this is a physical harm this is going to harm us if we are infected and even if we're not uh, we could be carriers of it and we might affect others so uh, we should protect we should take the necessary measures yes we have tawakkul but we have to tie the camel as well we have to take the action so absolutely we need to do this but the point really i want to make is we need to re- realize that there's also spiritual harm 
uh, out there, right? There's there's harms that impact our Islam, in fact, uh, you know, impact our deen, uh, such as secularism. And you know, a lot of parents, as they used to say, and you know, you want to protect your children, so you we've taken them outside of the schools. We've taken even when the government didn't say, many parents took the children out of, out of school because of the harm. But the question I really have is, how many of us would have taken our children out of school? because of what they're teaching them in terms of LGBT and all of this, right? So what I'm saying is that as Muslims, we need to see that balance. There's lots of harms in society. Yes, coronavirus is one of them, but there's also the, the ideological, spiritual harm that we should uh, balance and think about too. So inshallah, in this time, when we're at home, reflect, read Quran, you know, get closer to Allah and really ask, you know, what are all those harms out there that we need to avoid and stay away from? Jazakallah, bro. Brother Haylor. Yeah, I'd echo that, to be honest with you. Um, some really good points there. But um, my advice is, look, it's, a, it's the month of Rajab. Ramadan is coming very soon. This is probably the perfect opportunity for us to really now prepare for the month of Ramadan. Um, let's, not take, let's not go crazy about you know, what's happening. Um, let's you know, get closer to Allah, learn, you know, use this as an opportunity to now actually learn about something in Islam that you were probably planning on doing, but you'd never get around to it because you're so busy, you know, spend some time with the children and, and family and parents, if they're healthy, obviously, and, um, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, make the most of it because, um, you know, this is probably a blessing in that sense. For us, inshallah. So. The, the, the situation reminds me of that uh, hadith that talks about take, make use of five before five. Mm. Um, you know your your age, your health, your wealth. Uh, what were the other two? Youth. Youth. Youth, Youth before. Yeah, and then life. your um, and your life before life. death. As well. So it, it brings pretty much all of those into perspective. But uh, I did have one one final point, and and oh, that's oh, <laughs> you got you still got a point. You still got a point to make. <laughs> yeah, man, I get charged for this bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, the the final bit was just going going back to my role model as well, who I'd like to spend quarantine with, i.e. Uh, Salahuddin. It was all about implementation. So the rules that you that you do know uh implement them and people always say you know you you practice islam in your home first now's your opportunity yeah uh whatever knowledge you do have of islam share it with your children and your family and you you might have actually saved some time because now you don't have a commute to work an hour it's up to an hour and a half in the morning maybe even two depending on what you're doing and then the same in the evening what are you doing with that time you're either spending it on social media scrolling um well, definitely watch this on social media and like it and share it. But you know, <laughs> um, but be, besides that, um, you know, where, where's the time going, or is it just being wasted? So make make use of your time because it's likely this is going to go on for you know maybe even twelve weeks. So in twelve weeks' time, could you come out of this isolation situation saying, "I'm I'm a better person or a better Muslim," or I've memorized verses of the Quran or I've taught my kids this? or I've learned X amount of Hadith, or I've implemented this, or are you going to come out brain dead because all you've done is go through as many YouTube videos as you possibly can to the point where YouTube has blocked you. <laughs> okay, uh, subhanAllah, I've just, uh, there's a remaining meeting time that's popped up. So, uh, I mean, I'll have to echo, echo, echo that because from what you guys have said, um, there's not really much I can add. The only thing I would say is... Um, a lot of people that in the past where I speak to um, and, uh, you know, generally people my age, in their 20s, but, you know, pe 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 people like <laughs> in, in my age and, uh, and what they say is that, look, bro, I, you know, I really want to, but I haven't got time. You know, I've got to get home. Kids are there. Kids just need to sit with the kids for a bit. I've got work and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, you know, like uh, uh, Brother Adri said, you know, make the most of time. And now that excuse isn't there anymore. I'm not saying that they will make an excuse in a bad way. You know, if that was an obstacle, the obstacle, Allah's removed the obstacle for you now. So now is the time. And one last thing I want to add really is about the Juma thing that uh, uh, Adri's pointed about. And I never really thought about it. That, you know, subhanAllah, you know, one Juma we missed last week and obviously people were disappointed. Of course they would be, you know, go to the mosque and stuff like that. But you know, there's an opinion out there that in reality, 
you cannot have a Juma Juma Salah without the Khalifa. You know, even the Hanifi fiqh, they 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 a lot of them pray Dhuhr because they believe that you cannot have a Juma Salah without a Khalifa. So subhanallah, if we were upset after one week that we, we never had Juma Salah, subhanallah, the Khalifa has been absent for almost a hundred years now. You know, and that should really that should that should really hit home, and think you know what, Subhanallah. You know, without even realizing it, we we're living in a in a bubble, where you know we're doing our little things, but it's very disconnected to the Ummah and Islam at, at, at most. But yeah, obviously, um, you guys have made all the points. Um, just everyone stay safe, and I think Subhanallah, this is this. Uh, Obviously, once we check the recording and once we compile this and we get it out, I think you know uh, this medium is good, especially the fact that a lot of people are going to be at home now. Obviously, we can't get to the studio because of quarantine. And Jazakallah uh, Khair for address really suggested this this uh, this software we're using. Um, so you know, inshallah, if it works out well, we will do these. You know, normally we do podcasts every two weeks, but you know, at the end of the day, if there's a de- if there's a demand, there's no harm in uh, doing one of these. Once a week, to be honest with you, and 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 also I've been on Instagram doing a few Instagram lives, and I tell you why, you know, you know when you're out and about and you're always speaking to people and your work and you speak to people giving dawah and whatever, you know, if after a few days when you've been working from home and you're not been doing that, you know, you just want to talk to people, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> you, know, yeah, you just want to talk to people. You want a question. You want people to ask you something. You want to interact. Yeah. So Alhamdulillah, you know, I think we can do that. So inshallah, what I'm going to do, brothers, I'm going to bring this podcast to an end. Jazakallah uh, khair to all of you uh, to participate. And really, it's been a pleasure to speak to all of you. The one advice I have to Adris, brother Adris, uh, he knows I love him, is brother Adris, you need to buy a lock. Purchase a lock, <laughs> right? Next time. Right? There's a there's, lock if there's a riot next time in your house, yeah, <laughs> then uh, we'll have to sort you out. But I'm, I'm just preparing them for what to do then, like, in case it happens either way around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah, so inshallah, you'll uh, to to all our listeners and and, and you know whoever's watching this or whoever's listening to this, you know, inshallah, if you find it beneficial, share it with other people. This is a time when you have uh, you'll be at home, uh, like brother uh, J- uh, JK said, uh, read the Quran, read the meaning, uh, the tafsir, you know, watch YouTube. There's some excellent. Um, Seerahs on YouTube Whether it's uh, Well One's been removed You won't be able to see that But the other one You will do And that's uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi He's done an amazing seerah And also we have Our own seerah specialist Brother JK And uh, You know We've done a few episodes Of Talking Seerah You can find that On our On our sites So uh, Inshallah supporters You can find the content That we have You know Where uh, our content Is on uh, YouTube On Instagram On all popular pro- uh, platforms popular podcast platforms you know we've got facebook we've got a, a blog site alhamdulillah we're trying our best to get uh, uh, to generate an awareness out there um so inshallah supporters because we need the support and uh, really you know all i can say is uh, stay safe and uh, think of others probably think of others even before you think of yourself and uh, really make most of the time uh, so yeah on that note uh, brothers uh, uh Assalamu alaikum to all of you guys and assalamu alaikum to all the listeners and the viewers at home. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.